going to talk about the, uh, the non-syndromic single suture cranial stenosis. So the single suture cranial stenosis include the unicoronal uh, metopic um, sagittal and um, lomboid. So that's the uh, patient you could see from this slide, like um, different single suture synostosis, they have different uh, characteristics. So how about the surgical indication for single suture cranial synostosis? So you just uh, only to remember that the metopic is the most different from the others. So why it is different? Because the metopic has three forms. Like you can see from these pictures on the, uh, the left one, that's the severe form. Like uh, if you see the patient from the top of the skull, you can see uh, very clearly there's a lateral orbital ring and there's a prominence on the midline of the forehead. So uh, the second one is the moderate form. The moderate form is that uh, when you see on the top of the skull, you probably can see or you probably cannot see the lateral orbital ring. For the mild form, usually you do not, you cannot see the lateral orbital ring. So how about the surgical indication? Right now there's, um, for the mild type, because the chance of spontaneous recovery is high, so it's not recommend for the surgery. For the moderate type, there's no recommendation. So there's only recommendation for the surgery is for the severe type. So that's our case of the uh, med metopic synostosis. I think this one is a my, uh, moderate form of the case, but you still see that the forehead is quite narrow. So after we did the reconstruction, the forehead is quite um, satisfied. So that's the, other, the next case of uh, uh, metopic synostosis. So this patient is also a moderate form. So we do the surgical simulation before the surgery and print out the surgical guide. So you could do the surgery uh, according to the surgical guide during the surgery. And it's quite easy to um, do the reconstruction safely and quick. So the, for the sagittal, uh, coronal, and lomboid, actually the surgical indication is based on expert opinion. However, because there's no spontaneous improvement of the abnormal skull shape, so um, most of the experts, they will recommend uh, to do the surgery. And only surgery can improve the aesthetic aspect and reduce the neurocognitive deficit and vision problems. So uh, should you do the minimal invasive or do the open cranial correction? Uh, for those single suture cranial synostosis, only sagittal synostosis has recommendations. So the, um, for the sagittals, uh, for the evidence-based, um, the aesthetic results are probably comparable in the short term, like one year post-op. However, um, for the long-term follow-up, the aesthetic result is not very clear. And also the neurocognitive and the visual result, they are not very clear. However, their recommendation is that if the patient come to you younger than 5.5 uh, months, then you can do the minimal invasive surgery. If the patient is older than six months, you should do the open cranial valve correction. Uh, if you do this open cranial valve correction before the age of six months, there will be a problem of the growth limitation of the skull. So like um, our cases, we do this patient at a very young age, at two months old, uh, to do the endoscopic strip craniotomy. You can see the result is very good. So that's the pictures uh, on below is two years follow up. So you can see a stable result and a very good shape of the head.
cat. So that's the other case. We also do the surgery at two months old and we do the um, strip craniotomy, a uh, strip uh, suturectomy about like five centimeter in the middle and also do the like barrel strip uh, on the side. So for this case, uh, you can see it lo really looks like an Asian type skull shape uh, because after the surgery, um, he lie on the on the posterior, he lie flat on the posterior. So you, you could see that the posterior uh, part of the head is quite flat. This, this uh, patient, he come to me uh, quite late. Uh, however, after discussion, we still um, decided to do the endoscopic strict cranial atomy. It's about like 5.5 months old. Uh, for this case, we, we use a helmet. For the previous two cases, we didn't do the helmet because after discussion, the patients, they are rel reluctant to, to, to have the helmet. However, for this patient, we suggest to do the helmet because uh, he comes to us, it's quite late. So after three helmet, and the picture on below is about one year, uh, one year. Uh, I will say that um, I think that the age is the key problem for the endoscopic because according to the orthotic, um, he said it's quite difficult to shape the skull. However, you 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 still can see that skull shape is uh, improved, but compared to the previous two cases, it's not uh, improved that. <laughs> so for the uh, metopic, um, the evidence only shows that if you do the minimal invasive surgery, the reoperation rate is about 25%. If you do the open type, it's about 3.8%. However, there's no recommendation for the surgical technique. For the unicoronal, there's also no recommendation. Uh, there's a review of the 207 case, uh, patients of a six year follow up there's no reoperation cases uh, because of the elevated intracranial pleasure. However, if you do open like by coronal incision and open cranial valve surgery, there still have a problem of the temporal hollowing and supraorbital retrusion. For the lumboy, there's also no recommendation uh, for the surgical technique. However, from my personal experience, I still think that if you do the minimal invasive surgery, there's a very high chance of a uh, uh, This patient, he did the, um, the tuturectomy at the outside hospital. And after the surgery, I think he did the surgery at the age of four months old. And after surgery, you could see that um, uh, he had a 11 like helmet for his skull. And when the patient is around like three years old, their parents are still not very satisfied. That's why finally uh, I suggest them to do the skull, re skull shape reconstruction. And also he had a like Chiari male formation for this patient. So I will talk about Chiari male formation um, in the following slides. So how about the timing of the, sur the surgery? So there's the recommendations only surgical has differences. Um, the only clear indication for early treatment is the increasing prevalence of uh, popular edema in sagittal suture cranial stenosis. So if possible, sagittal suture stenosis should perform before the age of six months. Uh, if the patient comes uh, like around 10 months old, I will do like only posterior valve reconstruction. If the patient comes late, like one year, 
I will do the total cranial, cranial valve. Like this patient is, um, is older than one year, I will do the total cranial valve. Like this patient for four years, also do the total cranial valve. So how about the others? Like metobic, there's no recommendation. Coronal, there's no recommendation. However, if you do unicoronal, it is suggested to do the, the FOA after nine months of age because the, the bone is better for the reshape. Like in this case, for the unicoronal uh, synostosis cranial uh, reconstruction, actually when you do the pre-surgical simulation and try to do the reconstruction, you will find it's quite interesting because um, when I do the unicoronal synostosis, I found this it's not very difficult to do the um, surgical design. You could see like on the picture on the on the left and on the top, you can see you just need, need you just need to cut like three pieces. Then you you just move around and you can find there's a very good shape of the reconstruction. That's the other case. I also use the same technique, and you can do it very quick and a nice result. For the lumboid, there's also no recommendation for the timing of the surgery. Like this case, I have to admit that the lumboid reconstruction is quite uh, difficult. It is not easy to get satisfied result because the plagiocephaly is sprung below to the top. So it is quite um, not easy to get a very good result. So the second part of, of my speech is uh, talking, I was talking about the syndromic cranial synostosis. So for the multi, um, multiple suture synostosis and the syndromic cranial synostosis, you should always memorize that. There's a uh, five uh, most common type, like Epers, Cruzon, uh, Sachin Chosen, Pfizer, and Milky. So how about the surgical indication? Actually, there's all indicated for surgery, uh, both for the cranial deformity and the risk of uh, elevated ICP. So you could see from the uh, right side, there's a table. Um, for the risk of uh, intracranial pressure, the um, you could see that like, the suction chosen is about like 20 to 35%. For the other, totally, the other multi suture is around 58 to 67%. However, for the milky, because there's a very low prevalence of the elevated intracranial pressure, so um, you could do the surgery like late, uh, like later than the other type. So how about the, the surgical methods? The recommendation for apers and cruzones, because there's a high risk of uh, increased intracranial pressure and also the Chiari male formation. So they suggest <laughs> you should do the occipital cranial expansion with distraction. That will result in a greater increase in head circumferences and also the intracranial volume. And you, uh, it also can significantly lower prevalence of the tonsillar and herniation and popular edema. So, um, okay, next slide. So, how about the surgical timing? They all suggest to do the surg surgery um, before one year because they found. Normal IQ is greater if the operation is performed uh, less than one year. So the optimal timing for the surgery is suggested to be between like six to nine months. If there's no earlier signs of increased intracranial pleasure. However, um, for the milky, because there's a low in incidence of intracranial pleasure elevation, so you could do the surgery like around nine to 12 months. 
So that's the um, conclusion um, for the uh, for the syndrome in cranial stenosis. For the surgical indication, you should do the surgery, of course, um, treat as soon as possible if there's evidence of elevated intracranial pressure. And how about the surgical technique? Uh, you should do a, a occipital expansion with distraction if the patient is apres or, or cousin. If the patient is such a chosen or milky because there's a lower prevalence of intracranial pressure, so you could do the FOA. So how about the timing? You should do the surgery around six to nine months. And if it is milky, you can do the surgery around like nine to 12 months. If you are you want to do the minimal invasive surgery, you should do it as, uh, before the age of six months. So that's our case example. Um, because the distraction device in Taiwan is quite expensive. And also usually there's a problem of a uh, um, uh, imported uh, problem. So we did this case at the age of one year old and it, um, do, do the FOA at the age of like 1.5 year old. So for this Apert syndrome baby, um, we do the VP charm at the age of four months because he has a uh, elevated intracranial pressure. And we do the posterior distraction at the age of 10 months. And um, when we remove the distractor, uh, we also do the syndactyly surgery. Uh, it's not done by me, by the other uh, surgeon. And after two months, we do the FOA. For the Apert syndrome, um, that's the, the other Apert baby. We do the VP shunt at the age of four months old. Uh, because um, at that time we have a problem of like a distraction device imported to our hospital. So we, we finally, um, and also the price problem. So we, we don't do the distraction. Uh, we do the FOA at the age of 14 months. And after the FOA, he did the syndactyly surgery. So that's the another Kuzum baby. Um, we do the baby shunt at the early age. And at that time, because there's no distraction device, so we do posterior expansion. And, and after six months, we do the FOA. So how about the mid-phase surgery? So the, the recommendation for the Cruzon and Pfeiffer and Eppers, you should do the external, external flan like this, the red device, and also do the distraction. Um, how about the timing? So usually they recommendate the external distraction should be performed around the age of eight to 12 year, uh, uh, years old or after the age of 17. So if the patient have a severe OSA, you can, or insufficient eye closure, you can do it earlier. So how about the age between the 12 to age 17? Because there's a higher risk of psychosocial problem and also the unrealistic expectation. So you should not do the surgery at the age like from 12 to 17. So that's our case of the Kuzong syndrome. The patient has um, no previous cranial valve surgery. He only did the VP shunt. So at that time, we do the monoblock distraction of steogenesis because he ha uh, she has severe OSA and she has a frequent admission because the up upper airway problem. And, um, and finally, we do the monoblock distraction and quite satisfying result. 
So the other topic I want to discuss is the, how about the screening for the ICP? So for the recommendation, only sagittal and syndromic patients should perform the phonoscopy. So others, you just need to do the head circumference measurement. For the sagittal, you should do phonoscopy and or the optical coherence tomography as an OCT um, annually at, until the age of six years. So they found that uh, the detection of the papillary edema has a higher incidence uh, between the age of three to six years. So you should do like, like phonoscopy or OCT until the age of six. And after six years, there's the, uh, the prevalence is quite low. So after six years, you don't need to, you still need to follow up. However, you don't, you probably don't need to do the phonoscopy. Um, how about the metopic unicoronal or lamboid? Um, lamboid because the prevalence of the papillary edema is quite very low. So you should just need to measure the head circumference. If the growth curve deflected, then you should do the phonoscopy or OCT. So that's the um, intracranial pleasure, the chances um, around different single suture synostosis. So how about the diagnostic tools? Um, because um, I, I believe in most of the countries, it is difficult to measure the definite uh, intracranial pleasure. Like in Taiwan, um, the, if you want to measure the intracranial pleasure, it's not covered by the insurance. So usually we don't do the intracranial pleasure uh, measurement. Um, but however, you, there's some like six uh, diagnostic tool you probably can use. Like the first one is the head circumference. And the second one is you can check the X-ray to see if there's um, presence of the diffuse impression. Uh, or you could do like a CT scan or skull X-ray to find if there's um, presence, presence of additional coronal suture fusion. And the other one is optical nerve ultrasound. Of course, you could do the phonoscopic and also the optical coherence tomography. So also in this article, he also lists um, the evidence of the, this, this six diagnostic tool. I just want to talking about the phonoscopic because um, if you um, do the phonoscopic, its absence does not real, really rule out the increased intracranial pressure, uh, pressure in children under eight years of age. So if the patient is younger than eight years of age, if you don't see there's a papillary edema, it doesn't mean that he didn't have an in increased intracranial pressure. And they found um, the OCT is probably a reliable methods for screening for increased intracranial pressure. However, that's a machine. So you, you require the patient's cooperation. Usually if the patient is older than four years old, then he probably can um, cooperate with the, the OCT. So the conclusion is that if you have a sagittal or a syndromic, you should do the phonoscopy and OCT or OCT um, uh, before the age of six years. So how about the Chiari meal formation? So they found that um, even the single suture synostosis, like sagittal suture, there is still uh, like three to eight percent of uh, incidence of uh, increased uh, the incidence of the Chiari uh, male formation. If it is lomboid, then it's around 
25 to 60%. So like this case of a lumboestenosis, we usually do MRI before the surgery because we want to know if he has a lumboestenosis. So like this case, um, he has a, a Chiari. So we do posterior expansion and also reshaping and foramen magnum decompression. So of course, for the syndromic cases, there's a high uh, incidence like a uh, Cruzon and Pfeiffer. Um, if it is Eppers, then the incidence is lower than the Cruzon and Pfeiffer. So that's the recommendation conclusion. Um, you should do the MRI in a unilumboid suture or Cruzon or Pfeiffer or multi suture if it involves the lumboid. And you should repeat the MRI at the age of four years uh, or at the age of 18 years, or uh, if you are suspicious if uh, uh, on a symptomatic Chiari. Of course, you should follow up at a pediatric neurosurgeon's clinic because they always they probably know there's a neurological signs of a uh, um, Chiari. So the last part of my speech, I want to talking about some spatial issues in cranial stenosis. So the first is, I think that's an interesting topic because you always see some patients with a surgical stenosis, but without the scaphal cephaly. So how should you do about this kind of patients? Like this, this patient I have, uh, he's a sagittal, but he didn't look like a, a sagittal stenosis because he didn't have a scaphocephaly. Usually this kind of patient, they comes very late. So this patient, when he comes to me is around like three years old, because he has a development delay, uh, also a speech delay, so I did uh, a mid valve expansion surgery for him. And finally, his mother is very satisfied because he has a very good improvement on the motor and speech. So that's the other case. I did the total cranial valve reconstruction. Uh, I did it uh, uh, around the age of three years old. Before the surgery, he complained about headache. So how about the literature review? So I found that there's very few um, paper talking about the, the sagittal stenosis without the scaphocephaly. Like this patient, uh, sorry, like this paper published in 2010, that's from Oxford. They found the incidence is around like 4%. Uh, they defined the increased intracranial pressure is above 15. So there are only eight cases and they do the ICP monitor in six cases. And they found like the four cases has increased intracranial pressure. So that's 67%. So the summary of this paper, uh, this paper is talking about, it is important to recognize this patient because they are at a higher risk of developing rest intracranial pressure. So that's the flow chart of their recommendation that you can see it on the right side. Um, if there, the patient has no scaphocephaly, you should see if there's any um, signs of the intracranial pressure or if the patient has a development delay uh, um, and you can perform the ICP monitoring to see if you should do the surgery or not. However, if there's no evidence of intracranial pressure, you could do like monitor. You can, you can consider repeat CT scan in two years. So there's another paper published in 2017 from Pittsburgh. There's a totally uh, 52 cases. Uh, their schedule comes late, more uh, after one year. Um, 
there are from the 52 cases, there are 69%. They don't look like a scap uh, sagittal because there's no scaphocephaly. So they do the surgery uh, in night patients, only 17% because if the patient has a increased uh, intracranial pressure or abnormal eye findings, or if the patient is severe scaphocephaly, then they will do the surgery. For the eye exam, they will check if the patient uh, has a popular edema, or they also check the visual evoked potentials. The definition of the increased intracranial pleasure uh, is more strict, is more than 20. So you can see the flow chart from this, um, from this slide. If the patient has severe scaphocephaly, you should do the surgery. Uh, if the HF is okay, you should do the eye exam first. If it is normal, then you should do the surgery. If it is normal, you should monitor. If you don't know, uh, you are not sure, you should do the ICP monitor. Uh, however, the ICP definition is more strict, is more than 20. However, if you want to, uh, you don't do the surgery and you only want to monitor, you should do every six months check, you should check eye every six months. Uh, if the patient more than 10 years old and there's no concern, then you don't need to follow up. So uh, the last um, spatial issues I want to talk about is the complex cranial stenosis. So what is the complex cranial stenosis? It's like uh, this one. It's a multi suture but it's not a syndromic type. Um, like this patient has a very severe uh, synostosis. He has a sagittal uh, and also a unicoronal. So the, um, the papers come from um, Ferron uh, in 2011. So he defined a complex pattern of synostosis that do not have a ready, uh, readily identifiable underlying syndrome. And the incidence is about like 4%. So it's quite few. So it's about 4%. And um, he, uh, he decided to do the surgery according to this line uh, behind the coronal suture. Uh, if um, it involves the posterior part, you should do uh, the posterior scout scout at the age of six to eight months. Um, if it involved the anterior valve, you should do the FOA between the age of like 10 to 12 months of age. So that's our um, experience of a complex cranial synostosis like this patient who was born uh, in our hospital. So this patient, um, because we do, we, we know that he is a complex cranial synostosis at a, a very early age. So we do the endoscopic straight suturectomy at the age of three months old. And, um, and um, we do the posterior expansion and foramen magnum decompression at the age of one year because we found he has a Chiari malformation. Like that, that is uh, this case. So um, in the first, we do the endoscopic uh, in a very early age to try to release the intracranial pleasure. And the second part, because he has a Chiari malformation and also has a very narrow posterior skull. So we do posterior valve expansion. You could see from this picture, you could see he, he has a, like a, we'll call it like a thumb printing side, or you can see there's the, the skull is, has a 
increase intracranial pressure. So I think the result is quite good because the patient, he, he has no development delay and he's very quite, he's a quite big baby, you know? So I, I think uh, we do a very good thing for this baby because he has a normal development. The other, um, uh, the other case for this patient, he is a preterm. Actually, if the baby is a preterm, he has a, has a higher chance of a cranial synostosis like this baby. Um, actually, he was uh, born in our hospital. And um, when he was like two months old, um, we found uh, there's a bicoronal in X-ray, um, in the skull X-ray. And at the age of one year follow-up, we found that he has a sagittal and bicoronal. So we do the FOA at the age of one year. So the patient has a very good development. So that is the, uh, the other case we recently have is a bicoronal uh, plus a metopic. Uh, we, um, I think we did it like uh, one month uh, ago. So we do posterior distraction and we also use the endoscopic to do the metopic tuterectomy at the age of five months old. So because I, we, we didn't finish the treatment so I cannot have the uh, pictures. Okay, so that's the end of my speech. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Dr. Liu's the presentation today. Is the, so any questions from the audience, the, please leave you a message on, in the chatting rooms. Uh, I have saw a lot of the interesting case from Professor Liu's the presentation today, and uh, she divided it in some different aspect of a different kind of a cranial synostosis, uh, especially for probably in the sagittal and the syndromic cases. And uh, she emphasized about the monitoring is using uh, the ICP mortality is different. So I have a one question is that uh, for some cases of patients presenting about the cranial synostosis and that we were performing the, put a lot of hardware on in his the scalp. So would you like to choose the absorbable or uh, absorbable plate for uh, this kind of patient, because they just only probably is only lasting for uh, a short times. Yeah. So, what is your opinions? That cost. <laughs> so, uh, you mean like uh, uh, like a distraction, distraction or the? Uh, sorry, I I just closed the line. So uh, what do you mean that like internal device? Yeah, yeah internal device. You mean like absorb, uh, absorbable and uh, non-absorbable plate? Um, I, mm, actually we, we do have insurance pay for the with, uh, absorbable plate right now. So we do, we use the absorbable absorb, plate for, for, for this patient. Um, I, I think the result is quite good because you don't do another surgery. Like before we put non resolvable plate and we have to remove the device after six months. So mm, I think that's a, quite a good result. However, if you are uh, using this device for an uh, older patient, you probably can choose another one. Like in Taiwan, we have another kind of uh, absorbable plate and also covered by the insurance. That's more strong. It can last for like four years. I think that's more suitable for uh, older patients. But if you, you do the a baby surgery, then you can use the the plate like it will dissolve in like one to two years. 
Okay. And uh, one question is how long helmet will uh, should be worn after surgery? If you do the endoscopic, it usually suggests to wear the helmet around until the age of one year. Because after one year, usually um, the change will be very limited. Okay, and and uh, I'm I'm wondering what kind of uh, the computed tomography you prefer. Are you using you using the the usual probably is the facial bone of the or the brain CT to evaluate the the skull problem, or uh, could we uh, replace it by the combined CT or some some kind of a low dose radiations the com computed tomography. What is your So actually, um, our CT scan, we talking with our pediatric radiologist. So actually the, the X-ray is quite low. It's maybe mm, usually uh, it's, it's a, the radiation dose is around like seven or seven to 10 slides of the X-ray. So the radiation is quite low, but I'm not sure about the like like um, the other device uh-huh okay because uh, sometimes uh, probably we can use in the combined ct to evaluate only the bony uh, materials the, nah, because we are not really want to see the soft tissues or uh, okay another question is that uh, is there a volumetric analysis target in the surgical planning uh, you mean uh, um, actually when when we do the surgery, there's no surgical guideline for the volume we should um, what volume we should do. But during the surgery, of course we do the simulation. However, I will do as big as possible. You know, we print out the surgical guide and we um, we know the shape. However, when I do the surgery, I will do as big as possible. Every time I just, I just caution by myself that I, can I close the, close the wound, you know, like I will do it as big as possible. Okay. And the one question is that, do you have any experience with semi-rigid fixations of the bones with sutures? Uh, semi you mean like sutures? Uh, I have seen that like Dr. Farron uh, in Medical City Hospital in Dallas, he only used a PDS suture for the for the reconstruction. Um, I I think I uh, because our our surgery is, is paid by the insurance, so sometimes I I I just. Uh, I will do the um, reservoir plate plus some PDS suture, but I have no experience of like totally uh, PDS sutures. But I know it, it is a very good way to do it if you can. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, for the previous the questions, the, because the, the doctor is asking about the volumetric analysis, and here he, he, he means is the intracranial, the volumetric analysis. Yeah. Do you do any kind of the intracranial volumetric analysis in your uh, simulation? Uh, before the surgery, we didn't do the intracranial vol volumetric an analysis, but we do the analysis after the surgery, um, after six months. We found that uh, usually um, the bowel expansion is around like 100 cc for our expansion, like for the sagittal. So that's the only data I have because I only have a close-up um, measurement, but we didn't uh, do it before the surgery because usually if you try to do as big as possible, you probably cannot close the wound, right? <laughs> so I just try to uh, do it during the surgery, but I will do it as big as possible. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, 
next question is, is there any uh, recommendations for uh, the follow up the CT intervals? Um, so from the, from the, from the, up, from the guidelines, um, uh, there's, uh, there's no talking about the CT uh, intervals follow up. They're only talking about the MRI for the Chiari. However, when I was in sickness, they will do the CT scan at the age of five year old. And I will do the surgery after uh, six months to make sure, sure if the bone healing well or not. But why um, they think they do um, CT scan at the age of five year old? Because they want to make sure if when the patient grow up, they probably will do some sports, like dangerous sports. Uh, they have to make sure uh, their skull, they are complete. There's no holes or big holes um, at the skull. So they will do the CT scan at the age of five. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, next question is from Dex. He, he is asking uh, before the absorbable plates, I think that our teachers always use in the stainless steel wires as a uh, hardware. So can we still use them if the absorbable plate are not available? Yes, of mm -hmm. course. Of course you can, but you still need to remove it after six months. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. And next question is, the, what is the risk of bleeding in complex cases? Uh, what is the risk? I, I think there's no difference of the risk, mm, but that depends on the, the neurosurgeon, I think. But I, I, from my understanding, I, I don't feel there's a, the risk is higher in the complex ones. So what is your average blood loss in your average, maybe not complex cases for your Single, usually, yeah, yeah, single shooters cases. I think it's usually like a 300 cc. Okay, okay. Next question is, uh, do you think the using of bone adhesives like octosanoacrylate are sufficient for stabilization or fixation? Oh, the bone I adhesive. What is the bone adhesive? I don't have the experience of that. Yeah, I, I don't have the experience as well. Is this a kind of uh, uh, bone cement or the bone adhesive? Okay, Arteos, uh, no acrylate. Uh -huh. Maybe we, we should check it later yeah. and uh, give the answer uh, for our audience later. Uh -huh. Yeah, so... Uh, are there any question? Oh no, this is a tissue adhesive. Tissue. Okay, so is this is very popular in India? Uh huh. Okay. Not much. Okay, thank you. But but anyways, uh, in Chang'an there is no this kind of uh, experience uh, for the fixation or stability stabilizations. Mm -hmm. So are there any questions for the Professor Lu about the cranial synostosis uh, for her today's presentations? Oh, so that's, oh, so uh, Dr. Yao said that's tissue glue. Tissue glue. Yeah, yeah, derma bone, derma bone. Oh, derma bone. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I don't, I don't, I think I will not use this as a, in, in a bone, I think. I think for the skin, it's quite okay, I think. But I'm not sure it's reliable for the bone uh, healing or the bone fixations using the, the tissue glues. Yeah. It probably is a question mark. Okay, for the next question is that, um, have you noticed any mental retardation correlation with the synostosis cases uh, or anesthesia at uh, early age? So I think from the, from the paper, they are talking about the mental retardation. Um, 
I think there's one uh, one page talking about if you do the surgery like my my slides, if you the, you do the surgery uh, before the age of one year old, then you probably have a normal IQ. But you could see from my slide. Can you see, see my slide right now? Like this one. I think that's an interesting question because they found that um, Apers has a lower IQ. And um, uh, I think that's the, this one. Sorry. Oh, got it. Okay. Uh -huh. So they found, found that uh, for the APERS case, uh, if you do it earlier, you probably have a normal IQ, but the percentage is quite low. So uh, that means that for the for the APER case, um, you there's a lot of chance of a mental retardation. But when I uh, when I uh, do the observership with Dr. Farron, he talking about if you do less surgery for apples, then he probably have a normal IQ. So that's why um, we do like we we try to do less surgery um, as possible. Um, like we do remove detractor with the syntactic surgery because we want to do less uh, operations for the apples. Um, uh, because they they are um, um, if you do less surgery, you probably um, has less effect of the anesthesia. So you probably have a normal IQ. That's that's what I know. Mm -hmm. Okay. For the next questions, are there variations in post-operative care in the various cases you presented? I think that they are, the care are all, all probably the same because right now we extubated the patient after surgery and we send the patient to the ICU care for like two or three days monitoring. And after the two, two or three days of uh, ICU care, we transfer to the normal ward and the patient can discharge uh, in one week. So I think all the cases, they are the same. But I, I think I have um, uh, experience of a uh, uh, box osteotomy. If you, you do the hyperterrorism, the box osteotomy, then it will feel, the patient will feel dizziness after surgery for a long time. So you probably have to admit the patient for a longer time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, so any questions for Professor Liu? Yeah, uh, I have one the final question for Professor Liu. Uh, in your uh, practice, uh, in your uh, experience, uh, I, I'm not sure is the, the birth rate of the craniosynostosis or for some cases with uh, some complex cases of uh, craniosynostosis, the prevalence is, the I think, is decreasing, right? So uh, in Taiwan, how do you think? Is it related to the pre, maybe pregnancy, the the the, the screening? Yeah. Um, you mean the complex? I think in Taiwan, our do uh, our um like GYN doctors, they they don't really um, know about the craniosynostosis, but however, I know uh they probably will know like zones or okay. like syndromic cases before the baby birth because they will find their head shape is not right. I know there, there are some um, doctors they found the problem, but the other craniosynostos they probably don't cannot find, I think. It's not easy to diagnose this, uh, during the during the ultrasound. Okay. So it's hard to be uh, detected uh, when the mother is pregnant, right? Okay, okay, thank you very much. All right.
uh, I have to say thank you again, thank Professor you. Lu, for your excellent presentation tonight and for so experienced uh, surgery and show a lot of uh, cases with us. Okay, I have to give you a big applause. And uh, I have to announce our next uh, presentation is the one week later. Uh, we are very happy to invite it, uh, our Singapore friend, Dr. Uh, Ching Ho Wong. Uh, Ching, Dr. Ching Ho Wong has been uh, our visitor in our hospital, and uh, currently he is an uh, international expert in uh, upper and lower blepharoplasty. So it's related to the craniofacial part. So uh, he is very kind and uh, very welcome to share his experience with us. So please. Uh, every friend looking forward to his uh, presentation next week. So thank you. Good morning and uh, good evening for all of you. And be safe and be healthy. Bye-bye. Thank you very much.